My name is Allison Lindbergh and I serve as a board member of the Minnesota chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council. Matt is the founding principal of the Thrive Collaborative. He is also an amazing speaker. I would like to thank our generous sponsors for supporting this keynote and all of you for being here. Join me in welcoming Matt as we conclude our Impact 2014 conference with his talk. Designing for the post-carbon economy, it's zero or nothing. What I really want to make the case for today is that we need to design everything from our systems to how we run schools, to our buildings, to our refrigerators, to our cars, everything. We need to design more like an old growth forest and less like a tree farm because monocrops fail. Everything that constantly needs external inputs over time fails, despite that short-term output. You can legibly figure out how much tree farm is producing until it's not. It goes from great production to zero very, very quickly. But biodiversity, biodiversity thrives. Biodiversity and complexity actually breeds resilience. And that's the way nature designs things. So complex systems, though, are not complicated systems. Our sewage treatment plants, our energy systems, those are complicated systems. They're not complex systems. They're actually overly simplified. And what happens with radically simple solutions, they always fail in nature, always. And when we become disconnected from these laws of physics, like 10-year-old little boys, like this kid is thinking he's going to have a great time. Water plus a 200-foot drop equals fun. But he doesn't understand the consequences of his actions. And I'll tell you, a lot of architects, the same thing, and designers and builders and people who create refrigerators and run schools and cities, we're also disconnected from these laws of physics. And we start designing buildings like this that people have dubbed the fry scrapers. And I say scrapers because he's actually designed multiple buildings that have done this. This is one in Las Vegas that was designed basically as a massive parabolic mirror that was frying Vegas tourists out by the pool. Right now what we're doing is we're building these buildings that are reduced to little boxes. And they're little boxes that are just not networked. Everything is built on this grid pattern. So what I contend is that whenever we design anything, whether it's a system or a product or our own homes, we have to ask a simple question. Is what we're building life degrading? Does it degrade the quality of life for the people right there and then all of the things in the network that is connected to? This is actually an overpass that came down in Seoul, Korea? Or is it life enhancing? Does it improve the life? Does it take less from its surrounding environment, from the people around it, than it is giving back? So what I suggest, and hopefully by the time we're done, I think we will prove that what we need to do is ungrid our energy system and ungrid our water systems. Because what we do is when we break things down in this com complex system into smarter, smaller component parts and we distribute the energy and we distribute the water systems, we get a much more resilient and better result. There's actually no such thing as a sustainable anything, one thing, because all of life is sustained by underlying networks. That's how nature works. When we violate that, when we fail to produce complex systems, when we oversimplify things and make them complicated, but not complex, they fail. Benoit Mandelbrot, who was the father of fractal geometry, said that, think not of what you see, but what it took to produce what you see. So when you and it turns out everything in nature has the same fractal geometry. When we get down to the smallest component, it's just these little things repeated over and over and over again that are simple that create these complex networks. And this fractal geometry, we can see it in trees. We can see it in river systems, in watersheds. We can see it in our cloud patterns, in our storms. We can see it in cells. We can see it all the way out to the galaxy. So we really need to design for this kind of complexity. 
that's the big what. And as Sir Mix-a-Lot once said, I like big what's and I cannot lie. And it turns out that these kind of patterns are actually hardwired into us. They call it biophilia, this in innate love of nature. And what they found, this is actually a Jackson Pollock picture with a bunch of mathematicians actually discovered that there is this zone of fractal dimensions that actually reduces stress. You go below or above this little zone of these fractal dimensions and your stress levels actually go up and they calm you down. Well, it turns out, and there's no way that Jackson Pollock could have known what he was doing. This looks like complete chaos. It's not, there's a pattern there. There's a pattern that actually calms us down that other splatter paintings do not mimic. And people who do not know Jackson Pollock when they're put in these simulators with fMRIs are actually experiencing calm when looking at a Jackson Pollock painting, but not a random splatter painting because it's not random. There is a pattern there. And that pattern actually mimics the same pattern that we're finding in nature. And we're finding this pattern repeated endlessly at various levels of magn magnification. So if we zoom in, so each one of these, the Jackson Pollock painting and the tree has a certain fractal dimension. And if we just take a little po po portion of that and we zoom into it, it has the same fractal dimension. No matter how much you go in, no matter how much you pull out, the fractal dimension remains the same. It's absolutely extraordinary to think about. So instead of asking what's the next big thing in designing net zero buildings, what we really need to be talking about is what's the next small thing? You know, so things like CBEX and all these other things where we target old buildings, existing buildings, are irrelevant when your target is zero. So I ask you the question, what is the secret to net zero energy then? It's clearly not the building. Buildings don't use energy. This building doesn't use energy. It's all the stuff we put into the building that uses energy. And this is where the successes have been in net zero buildings, is that they're beginning to focus on how we use buildings. So we're, we're not just looking at the building design, which is vital, but you have to strike this balance between the building design and the behavioral design. So now California code is starting to require net zero energy because they know this is possible. We just need to do this. If we're gonna get to these carbon targets by of zero by 2030, we need to start doing this now. All new homes are required by code to be net zero energy starting in 2020. Net zero ready by 2016, two years from now. So we really have to ask ourselves a question, what is the urgency? How quickly do we really need to be doing this? On Monday, I don't know if any of you caught this. I just learned about this yesterday. On Monday, a group of researchers down in uh, Antarctica discovered that the western shelf of Antarctica is melting at a rate that is way beyond anything and, is a, and could calve, right? The words they used in the study that they released after this discovery was that melt appears unstoppable. Sea level rise when this thing goes in this century will be 10 feet or more because of this one event. 10 feet or more. They're saying that it's unavoidable and that the collapse of this ice shelf is inevitable. It's going to happen. 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. That's where we are today. Last year was the first time we ever went over that number. Now, just as a reminder, 450 is the number to avoid all the most catastrophic consequences for humanity in the coming century. So everybody knows a couple of years ago that there was a... Um, typhoon that hit uh, the Philippines. And it was during the Doha Climate Conference. This was a speech given by the delegate from Doha, from uh, the Philippines, who incidentally a year later was at another climate conference. And during that climate conference, there was another typhoon that was worse than the one he's talking about here. An important backdrop for my delegation is the profound impacts of climate change that we are already confronting. And as we sit here every single hour, even as we vacillate and procrastinate here, we are suffering. Madam Chair, we have never had a typhoon like Bopa, which has wreaked havoc in a part of the country that has never seen a storm like this in half a century. Finally, Madam Chair, I'm making an urgent appeal, not as a negotiator, not as a leader of my delegation, 
But as a Filipino, I appeal to the whole world. I appeal to the leaders from all over the world to open our eyes to the stark reality that we face. I appeal to ministers. The outcome of our work is not about what our political masters want. It is about what is demanded of us by seven billion people. I appeal to all, please no more delays, no more excuses. Please let Doha be remembered as the place where we found the political will to turn things around. I don't think there's been a time where I've ever heard that, where I didn't get tears in my eyes, and I show this picture of my daughter. This is my daughter, Jane. In the year 2050, she's going to be 42 years old. 42 years old. She's now five years old. <laughs> she has a little sister, Dahlia. Dahlia will be 37 in the year 2050. So the work that we're doing is so incredibly urgent, and these goals are incredibly ambitious, but everything that we do in the USGBC, at Anderson Windows, every work that we, piece of work that we do has to have this sense of urgency to it. And when we understand the why we have to do this stuff, that net zero energy is mandatory, and net zero water is mandatory, then the how is gonna flow very, very easily. And we can get to zero output by the year 2030. This is the city of Detroit. It took 200 years for it to become one of the largest, one of the most prosperous cities on the planet. Fourth largest city in America. It's gonna take only a few years to take some of the 70 to 80,000 abandoned homes, homes, and put them into landfill. This is the proposal now. They're taking all of these buildings and putting them into landfills, as one writer put it, going from a house to trash in the time that it takes to do a load of laundry. What if we really rethought what we're doing with these buildings and seeing how quickly things can go bad or go forward? This was just released this week from Google Maps. You can now go to a Google Map and see a same spot and how it changes over time. This was 2009. This was 2011 in Detroit. This is 2009, and if you look at this photograph, you can see all of the trash cans all out there. People were living in these homes. That's 2011. Here's people sitting in 2009 on their front porch. This is 2011. This is today. I know you're all looking at these pictures and thinking how sad it is. But I am, I, I, I'm not just saying this. I've never even been to a Chamber of Commerce meeting, but I have more hope for the city of Detroit than any city in the world. If I could pick one place to really transform and do the work that we want to do and create the model for a living city, created of living component parts, it is Detroit. This is the Kendrick building several years ago, Kendrick Manufacturing. This is the Kendrick building now. This is the Book Cadillac Hotel. Now imagine being the woman in the fur coat, having dinner with her husband and having cocktails and coming back to this building. This is the Book Cadillac Hotel now. This is Orchestra Hall. Probably the same woman with the same fur coat. Listen to a concert there. This is Orchestra Hall now. These are streets now in Detroit. What if we were to take some of those materials that are being pushed into landfills I estimate there were well over, very conservatively, over a half billion dollars worth of amazing materials in these buildings that can be harvested to build net zero energy and net zero water buildings and create these living communities. And this is what people are working on now in Detroit. So every time we build a living building, and if we choose to do this on the Ford property, we're choosing to be part of a transformation to communities that are socially just, that are culturally rich and are ecologically restorative, and we choose not to light the next fuse and create a really, really beautiful, beautiful place and comfort where we can experience love and happiness and joy. So I can't even begin to tell you how vital the work that you're doing in this room is. I mean, vital. And the choices you make 
to moving us to happiness, whatever the weather. Those choices, the Chinese say the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So let's start now. And I'll finish with just this, and then I'll stay as long as you guys want to ask questions, because we should really have a great dialogue after this. Benoit Mandelbrot, again, the father of fractal geometry, said that bottomless wonders spring from simple rules which are repeated without end. So now let's get to work.